those with evil hearts are full of pride and believe that they're better than those around them. They don't comprehend humility and they come off to many as arrogant. They always want to be right and rarely care to show kindness and empathy to others. And the Bible is clear that evil is something God never intended or created. If we're to be genuinely be free as created beings, we are free to choose something other than God's design and will. So we have the option to choose evil. And the Bible's also clear that there are consequences for rebellion against the will of God, which are personal, physical, and spiritual, and they also fall on family or community. Genesis 1.31 is evidence that God did not create evil. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Genesis 2, 16 to 17 says, And the Lord God commanded man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Proverbs 19, 3 says, A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Romans 1, 18 to 28 the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible, invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. So God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. And finally, Hebrews 2, 2 through 3 says, For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received is just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? So the Bible shows that sickness, famine, war, and death are all the result of moral evil, and we are all responsible for moral evil as people and as communities. We suffer because of our own sins, because of the sins of others and circumstances created by sin. Or the possibility like Job or the blind man healed by Jesus, there can be special purposes for suffering that God intends to do something with. The Bible shows that God did not create evil and he does not promote evil. Rather, he opposes evil in action. God limits the effect of evil. He warns us of the dangers of evil. He works to stop the spread of evil. He provides an escape from evil. And soon he will defeat evil for good. Uh, many falsely believe that God must immediately punish all evildoers and never bother those who are innocent. And if he doesn't, somehow they feel he is to blame for the evil. So I can encounter this a lot when people call me for help. Um, just today, in fact, someone called me and they were um, someone who felt that they had really earned respect from God by all that they had done for him. And then their spouse suddenly died in um, his 40s and they felt that this was somehow God's fault or he owed them better. And so they had been in this anger for six years over that God did not save their spouse. And so because it didn't go the way that they felt it should go now it was god's fault that this happened and that is something i hear a lot is blaming god for things that happen to people here these assumptions miss the whole point that god sent jesus to completely defeat the problem of evil and god created us with the freedom to choose our actions and then extended forgiveness to us something we definitely didn't deserve Forgiveness is the answer to the problem of evil for those who will choose to follow Jesus. Forgiveness releases the condemned from punishment. Forgiveness shows that there is a wrong that is to be made right, so evil is definitely not overlooked or excused. 
And since God chose to take our penalty upon himself on the cross, all suffering and evil can be overcome. And according to the Bible, any evil we experience has already been defeated. We have access to that victory if we will choose it. Many won't, but we have access to it, all of us. John 3, 16 to 21 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. John 16, 33 says, And I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. God himself took the consequences of our sin so that every person can have access to forgiveness and salvation. And as a result, all sin, evil, and suffering will someday be completely ended. And many people will not, will not come to God unless they are brought into some kind of suffering. It's just the nature of how we have become. We just don't choose him for any good reason. We have to, in desperation, be brought to that point. So that is a main reason why God will allow evil and suffering is because most of us would end up lost eternally if he did not. That is the only way some of us got saved. Leslie Vernick is an experienced counselor and author, and he speaks on this issue and how to identify an evil heart. He says, as Christian counselors, pastors, and people helpers, we often have a hard time discerning between an evil heart and an ordinary sinner who messes up, who isn't perfect and full of weakness and sin. I think one of the reasons we don't see evil is because we find it so difficult to believe that evil individuals actually exist. We can't imagine someone deceiving us with no conscience, hurting others with no remorse, spinning outrageous fabrications to ruin someone's reputation, or pretending he or she is spiritually committed, yet has no fear of God before their eyes. The Bible clearly tells us that among God's people, there are wolves who wear sheep's clothing, it's true that every human heart is inclined towards sin, that it includes evil, that we all miss God's mark of moral perfection. However, most ordinary sinners do not happily indulge evil urges, nor do we feel good about having them. We feel ashamed and guilty, and rightly so. These things are not true of an evil heart. The heart of the unrepentant person is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? According to Jeremiah 17, 9. And many people are bent on doing those things that are wrong without any concern for others or their own souls. And here are 10 verses that actually speak of an evil heart. Isaiah 59, 7 through 8 says, their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There's no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along with them will know peace. Jeremiah 17, 9, I just read, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is just desperately sick. Who can understand it? Titus 1, 15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. Matthew 15, 8, this people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's people who say they love God. They may even come to church week after week. They participate in church, but the fruit they produce is evil because their hearts are far from God. And it says by their fruits, we will know them. Matthew 15, 19 says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slander. And that is, by nature, our hearts are evil, but those who are determined to live for God allow the Holy Spirit 
to heal and purify our hearts so that we don't produce those things. An evil person does not. Daniel 4.16 says, Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods pass of time, seven periods of time pass over him. And it may seem that if those that have an evil heart are prospering, they may be prospering now, but it is promised that they will not prosper for long. God will put them down. He has promised. So we should not worry that they are going to continue to prosper in their evil. Psalm 50, 19 says, You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. Evil hearts are experts at fooling others with their smooth speech and flattering words. I always tell people, I know when the devil's coming for me because he flatters me. The person will call me and they will say something flattering to me about how amazing I am or how they love me so much, someone I haven't talked to for a long time. I always know that it's dripping sweet. I immediately brace myself for something that's going to try to trick me or trap me. Romans 2.8 says, But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Proverbs 2.14-15 through 15 says, They reject feedback, or it says, Who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. They reject feedback, real accountability. They make up their own rules. God says if they do not repent, they will be punished. They do not struggle against sin or evil. They actually delight in it. Oddly, many of them masquerade as someone with noble character, and they actually feel they have noble character. They really do believe they do. They're so deceived, they actually feel that they are the noble ones. They do not care about who they hurt. They feel entitled to that too. It's all about what they want. They will even hurt those who are closest to them in the pursuit of their goals. So they may love you in every way until you stand in the way of something they don't intend to lose. And then suddenly everything changes. Suddenly you are completely cast out because you got in the way of something. Job 15.35 says they conceive trouble and give birth to evil. Their womb fashions deceit. So they're experts at doing that which is wrong. They seek to create confusion and contention wherever they go. They twist facts, they lie. They will do whatever they have to do to accomplish whatever it is they intend to accomplish. They will make up whatever they need to do to make it stick. Those with wicked hearts can be detected easily when you know what signs to look for. Unfortunately, it can be easily, it can easily happen actually to people who are once believers who fall out of their relationship with God because they allow the devil into their heart. And this generally is agenda driven. It has something to do with somewhere where they're, they're trying to go somewhere where they have to bring in some extra source besides what God can give them. Evil will manifest rapidly and cause the heart to become cold, hardened, and empty. Any good that is left within them will be overtaken by the evil if they are not careful and repentant. They will then try to infest those around them with this wickedness because they want to build a camp or a team. Here are the signs you need to look out for when understanding that you're dealing with a wicked person rather than an ordinary sinful person. Those with wicked hearts can be detected easily when you know what to look out for. One would be no remorse. When a person feels no conviction from sinning against God, they have a callus that forms over their heart. And with time, the heart can become so hardened that they have no remorse for their actions. And the less we feel the need to repent and tell God of our sin, the more evil we will become. They simply do not feel sorry for hurting others and will instead find some enjoyment out of it. If you press them on the fact that they're unapologetic for their behavior, they'll deflect, they'll push it back onto you and gaslight you into thinking the reality is, it's you, not them. They enjoy another's misfortune 
Someone with a wicked heart will actually find enjoyment in another's misfortune. Instead of being able to emphasize or sympathize with the struggles of others, they find it amusing, funny, or something to chatter about. They're unable to remember the pain that they have also felt when they had these things happen to them. Instead, they rejoice in suffering of others and feel better than them. They may feel lucky that it didn't happen to them or blame the person for their misfortune. For example, they may say that they brought this on themselves. The cold evil heart is dangerous because it further puts down those who are already hurting. There's never, never an excuse for that. They're controlling and manipulative. Evil people want to maintain control of everyone in their lives and will use manipulation to do so. They will never admit fault because it would ruin the illusion that they have control. Oftentimes, wicked people will be kind to you only to get something they need from you later, such as money or a relationship. In turn, they can be obsessive about controlling every bit of your life and come off mean because of it. Defying the wishes of an evil person can result in terrible actions being taken against you. They aren't always obvious and may feel subtle. The goal of the evil person is to control the way you feel on the inside and now how you feel on the outside. They want both destroyed. Also, a lack of responsibility. A wicked heart has no sense of a moral compass. They will do whatever they please without taking any responsibility for the pain and the hurt they're causing others. As long as it makes them feel good and it works for their agenda, that's all they care about. They don't think about how their actions will impact others and frankly, they do not care. The evil heart will deflect and place blame on whoever else, not themselves. They honestly feel that way. They will never apologize. They even may feel like they're the one who's owed, the one who's wronged. They think apologizing is a sign of weakness and would rather have someone else apologize for their mistakes than for have, to have them apologize. This person also can be detected by no humility. Those with evil hearts are full of pride. They think they're better than those around them. They have no sense of humility. They come off as conceited and arrogant. They will fight tooth and nail to try to prove that they're always right. This is a direct contradiction to what the Bible wants us to be like. James 4, 6 reads, God is at war with the proud. Satan's pride is what caused him to rebel against God and fall from heaven. And those with wicked hearts that have lost care to show kindness and empathy towards others are following the example of the devil. There is no other way for them to explain it. They are also prone to cruelty. Some people are subtle about how hardened their hearts are, while others are much more open about it. Not all evil people are sly. Some are very vocal about how cruel they want to be towards others. This can come in various forms, such as getting into fights, emotionally and physically hurting loved ones, even hurting animals. Those who are very evil will push their cruelty too far and do serious damage that could lead to others going to the hospital or them ending up in jail. This would be the case often of domestics, the abuse inside close relationships. If you notice this sign in someone, the most important thing you can do is remove yourself quickly from the relationship. There really isn't another solution at that point. They are desensitized to other evil. Someone with a cold and wicked heart will not react to the evil in the world the same way they, the rest of us might, or those of us who don't want to have an evil heart. Instead of feeling moved emotionally by tragic events, they'll act as if it doesn't phase them at all because it doesn't. They won't care about the suffering of the victims and their families. They have no affliction to the world's negative events. They watch it on the news. They might be shocked when they see the impact of it, but they don't want to watch it twice. They're already bored. Evil and wicked people can be incredibly terrifying because they have a complete lack of empathy for other people. They'll do things that you might think are unimaginable for other humans to do, and it's important to avoid people with hardened hearts because there's only one way this is going to turn out, and you're going to be broken. That's the only option with this kind of people. God wants us surrounded by people that support us, love us, and bring us closer to him, not by this type of person. And what's kind of um, unfortunate about this is that 
someone who has taken this direction, they have chosen to walk this way, they can mass influence people around them, especially in a place where it, employment is involved. If the person at the top has this, where they can operate this way, and then others have to become the same to survive the employment, you will end up with a mob mentality. And then when someone is caught in that, the entire place turns against them. Even those who don't agree, they will turn against them too because they're fearful of it becoming them. They don't want the attention on themselves, so they start to act the same way just because of their fear. But because they act the same way, they're going to become the same way. It will not take long before they are of the same. Hard-hearted, no empathy, hurting people and not caring, actually feeling entitled to hurt people. There's no excuse for hurting people. So when you do it enough, for whatever reason, you will become that person. If you do not suddenly look up and say, I am acting that way, I am joining with the mob of people that hurt this person, you can make a choice to separate yourself from that and say, I don't agree with this, I'm not gonna be part of this, and boldly declare your amends to the person that's been hurt or you can keep going and become part of and have your heart harden and harden and harden until you don't even know that you're doing it. Some other indicators are evil hearts are pros at creating confusion and contention. They twist facts, they mislead, they lie, they avoid being responsible, they blame it on someone else, they deny reality, they make up stories, and they withhold necessary information that could clear it up and make the truth known. They withhold that. Evil hearts are also great at fooling others with their smooth speech and flattering words. But if you look at the fruit of their lives or their follow through, you will find there's no real change, no godly growth. It's all lies. Evil hearts crave and demand control and their highest authority is their own self. They reject feedback, accountability, and they make up their own rules. They use the Bible to their own advantage. They ignore and reject the parts that they don't like that would require them to change and repent. Evil hearts take advantage of the sympathies of good people. They demand mercy, but they give none themselves. They demand warmth, forgiveness, and intimacy from those that they have harmed with no care or acknowledgement of the pain that they have caused and they have no plan to make amends or to work on rebuilding broken trust or to just bring healing to the person they have hurt. They have no intentions of doing that. They don't even feel that they need to. Evil hearts have no conscience. They often masquerade as someone of noble character. They feel their actions should have no serious or painful consequences. They don't even think of, they don't want you to think of setting a boundary against them because they will accuse you of abuse. So when you decide that this person has hurt you enough and you decide I can't take anymore and you set a boundary, they will suddenly lash out at you and paint you as the person that is mean. And when they say I'm sorry, they believe grace is immediately due that they are immediately granted freedom from consequences of whatever it was that they did, and they believe forgiveness entitles them to full reconciliation and will pressure you to comply, and they feel completely entitled in that. You owe them <coughs> reconciliation. The Bible warns us, saying, but when grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. Even in the land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and do not regard the majesty of the Lord, Isaiah 26, 10. So the Bible confirms that talking to, reasoning with, trying to persuade someone with an evil heart is not going to change them. You will just suffer more painful consequences of trying to do that. The Bible shows us that when someone is genuinely sorry for the pain they have caused, they are eager to make amends to those that they have harmed by their sin. And this doesn't mean somebody did wrong or didn't do wrong. It isn't based on that. It is based on how we treated someone. 
Proverbs 25, 19 says, trusting in a treacherous man or woman in time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. Basically, it's foolish. So when someone shows themselves to be of this nature, you cannot trust them. You simply cannot trust them. It would be foolish, the Bible says, to trust them. An evil heart tries to persuade you that if they talk like a Christian, even if they just do that on Sundays, then they are a Christian. Even if no actions line up at any time in between, the Bible has very strong words for those whose actions do not match their talk. And John the Baptist said it best when he scolded the religious leaders in Luke 3, 8, saying, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Because if there is no change in their walk or how they treat others as prefer them over themselves, treat them better than you treat yourself, treat others the way you want to be treated, that's the demand of the Bible. If you're not doing that, your walk is not that of a believer. Your talk is not that of a believer. And everyone should question your relationship with God if you don't do that. Your relationship with God should be questioned because he has a completely different standard. A follower of Jesus follows Jesus. And he says, we will know them by their love. If you are not known by your love, then you need to look at the relationship you have with Jesus. When you confront an evil heart, chances are very good that the evil heart is going to confront you right back because the darkness hates the light and the foolish and evil heart rejects correction. Basically, avoid the battle because you're not going to get it resolved. When we resist the conviction of the Spirit, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And the more that we resist and grieve the Holy Spirit, the less we'll feel his urgency when he's saying, stop this and repent. We won't feel that anymore. And this is a very dangerous place for someone who's not a Christian, but believes in God. Because if they fall away, 2 Peter 2.21 says, it would be would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. If they claim to know Jesus and operate in opposition to his character and his priorities, that applies. It would be better for them that they had never known. The accountability gets much higher when you know and you turn from it, operating in the truth. Also, if we start growing discontented with things in life, our hearts will start to harden. The Apostle Paul says he has learned contentment, and despite beatings, stonings, lashes, and imprisonment, he could say in Philippians 4.11, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances, and we have to do the same. Contentment is learned. It is chosen and learned. The Apostle Paul also said in Philippians 4.12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So when discontentment or entitlement becomes anger, which it will, that becomes wickedness in a person's heart. That will lead to a wicked heart fairly quickly. Another very serious sign of an evil heart is that in many Christians' lives, you will see prayers without tears, giving without sacrifice, living without fasting, profession without persecution, prosperity without being poor in spirit, all while the world is going to hell. If a person cannot cry real tears for the lost around them who are facing forever in hell and petitioning God to save them, we not only care more about ourselves than others, we don't even care about God because he has one priority and that is bringing the lost to himself. And if your life does not show that you are kingdom building, that you are bringing those who don't know Jesus to him or those who don't know him correctly, who are deceived, 
to him or bringing those who know him to him if you are not creating the environment that Jesus created there is wickedness in your heart there's simply no other way to explain the lack of love for God and your fellow man. Mark Driscoll says, some people have a hard time thinking that a professing Christian can be evil, but the Bible is painfully pointed. For example, in Acts 5, 3, Peter says of one church member, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Evil people do not cause harm unintentionally as fools do. Instead, evil people intentionally plot harm, scheme to bring pain and destruction, and feel vindicated in doing so because of their hurt, self-righteous, or corrupt nature. The way to respond to an evil person is with nothing. The exact opposite of our response to a wise person. Draw near to the wise person, run from the evil person. Give more information to the wise person, no information to the evil person. Deal directly with a wise person, let the cops and lawyers deal with the evil person. A wise person can be influenced towards godliness, and a fool can perhaps be brought toward wisdom after they have sat in their mess for a while, but the evil person has to be considered hopeless apart from a dramatic intervention from God, one that does not involve you because there's little to nothing you can do. An evil person might not be beyond God's ability to help, but they are probably beyond your ability to help. We were talking to someone who was recently treated poorly by others in a ministry which is something that unfortunately happens and those of us who put this together me already realize that some of the things that were said and done to this person oppose God definitely oppose God and at that point it's like the disciples were told, shake the dust off your shoes and keep going because it would be worse for you if you stayed. Definitely don't fight to stay, but it would be worse for you if God had left you there because you would not know that you were in the company of people who are in a system of opposing God and how there's only one thing that matters to him. One thing, people. People are the only thing that matter to God. Not the size of a ministry, not the agenda of a ministry, not the money of the ministry. None of that matters to him. He hates that in opposition to his one care, and that is the people. And in God's eyes, people are the whole point of creation, people. And every single thing God has done is to bring people closer to himself. I have been guilty in the past of being in systems where I hurt people in the name of God. And I have come to regret that more than just about anything else in my life. God confronted me numerous different ways and through people and confronted that very behavior and let me know it was in direct opposition to ministry, real ministry for him. That when you aren't lifting and we have one role and that is to bring people to the kingdom. If people are directly opposing God and of an evil and wicked heart, those we aren't called to do but if it's anyone else we are to honor them we are to respect them we are to treat them with dignity anything less you will answer for at this point you separate 
and protect yourself and establish an end to these relationships with no contact or information going forward because they will just continue to hurt you. That's just the nature of where they're going. Evil people live by the power of demonic forces to harass and cause harm. Because of their demonic empowerment, they are far more powerful when seeking to cause harm than they otherwise would be in their normal life. They are able oftentimes to get into positions of power and then they create all kinds of minis, mini me's under them who become, like I said, a force that just batters people. Evil people who move into ministry leadership become wolves who strike. Their intention ends up scattering the sheep. They eat the sheep. They destroy the sheep. Evil people require a professional relationship with someone trained to deal wisely with their issues because the average person cannot get through to them. They are too arrogant. Their hearts are too hard. Talking to them rarely works. They will fight you. Will God punish the wicked? Yes, he will. For those who carry out atrocities and an atrocity to God is harming a sheep. Whether the sheep is behaved or not is not the issue. Those who prey on and hurt others and who don't repent and surrender to the Lord are going to come to a day of reckoning with God himself. And that is going to be a terrible day for them. Saved or not, it's going to be a real terrible day. He will allow the consequences of this sin and evil to fall hard. We've seen that in ministries where people have uh, done something in secret and then we'll see it on a show because at some point it gets exposed and the whole nation watches what was done in an office where someone in a religious role, a ministry leadership role, becomes known for their behavior. Everybody can see it. And I did not want to end up there. That scared me more than anything else, is ending up being known as a wolf. Some seem to get away with these things in life for a long time. If they get away with it in life, there will be horror waiting for them when they step out of this world into what Jesus described as, in Mark 9:44 where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. They'll be joined there by two men called the beast and the false prophet. Revelation 19.20 says, And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning, lake of fire burning with brimstone. So at the end of the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, we're told in Revelation 20:10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And because we are a spirit and we are eternal, if you choose to go there unrepentant of being a wolf, this is what's coming. So you better hope that God brings you to your knees before you meet him, because this is what's coming for you. 1,000 years after they were thrown into hell, they're still there. The fires of hell are neither consuming, meaning they don't burn up, their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Instead, those who end up there face an eternity in a place of burning, thirst, and darkness, with no hope of it ever ending. A place that is full of evil people, but it's also full of those who see themselves as good. Hell will also be filled with those who saw themselves as good and rejected their only hope of eternal salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, when received, causes you to love people in action. 
Romans 6.23 says, All sin is worthy of death. God is perfect and holy. No sin can be in his presence. It must be dealt with either at the cross or by eternal punishment. God is fair. He has given us an amazing door out of our sin. There, God is not fair in the sense that we should be punished. I'm someone who should be in hell. But I have been granted such amazing mercy and grace from God. I deserve none of it. I have had time to turn from a lot of my sin. A lot of it I wasn't even capable of turning from. I was just steeped in debauchery. I had... I don't know of anything in me that was clean. But God turned me. He gave me new thoughts. He gave me new desires. He actually did the work. He actually changed me because I wasn't even capable of knowing right from wrong at certain points. But I knew what pain felt like. I knew what rejection felt like. I knew what shame felt like. And sadly, I knew when I delivered those things to another person. The most outrageous thing I have done as a believer is to think that in some context that is okay. That there is some form of correction that allows you to exalt yourself above another human being that way. There isn't. I'm grateful for salvation because I don't deserve it. But I know it's available to anyone who says, I do not want to go to hell forever. I don't treat people very well. You might be a leader in ministry and you might be causing people great pain. I would suggest that you clean that up. This isn't about keeping people employed. This is about hurting people in the process. If you're not sure your sin has been dealt with, do not gamble with eternity. Hell is full of people who did. There's no second chances. If it were possible to be good enough to go to heaven, Jesus would have never had to leave heaven, come to earth, and die in our place. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? But God can give us a heart of flesh and take out that heart of stone very quickly. A fleshly heart is more pliable and easier to penetrate, which is just what God wants to do. If you do not feel the conviction of the Spirit in how you treat others, in how you hear God, in how you compromise your life, if you're not out seeing people lost, going to hell, and not desperately trying to intercept them, and you're calling yourself a Christian, you need to ask him to make repentance urgent in you. Do not grow in discontentment. Do not stay in any form of discontentment. We have to be able to sorrow over our sin, to shed tears in prayer for those who are not saved, to show no brokenness or humility. It is urgent that we stay in repentance, that we ask for forgiveness from God and those that we have wounded, and that we continue daily, sometimes hourly to surrender every part of our life to Jesus Christ. And the only way to know how to do that and how to walk like that is to know Jesus personally through being born again, which is criteria for going to heaven. And born again looks born again, acts born again, talks born again. It's not a mystery if someone's born again. They don't look like the world. They don't talk like the world and they don't act like the world. They act like Jesus. That's what born again does. You don't have a, a couple of options. You have one. If you aren't doing that, then don't call yourself born again and don't say you're going to heaven. 
the Bible is how you know who Jesus is and how to walk like him. And he covers just about everything. You have to read it to know it and to walk like him. Because if Jesus is all you have, you have everything you need. Precious Lord, you have been very long tarrying with me. You have tarried long with me. That's how I know how merciful you are because of your long suffering with just myself. I am most grateful that you have allowed me to go fully around that mountain so that I can see all the various levels of just my own conduct towards people as a Christian thinking that somehow that was acceptable to you. You do not care about much of anything except that people are valued and that they know that they are priceless to you. Help us to never be on the side again of diminishing people in any way, verbally, in our behavior. Help us, God, to be the group that exalts people to the so that when we are with them, they know that they are the apple of your eye. May they feel that kind of affection and importance and significance that you would move heaven and earth on their behalf. Help us to be that people and bring fast conviction in our negligence and our impatience and our hastiness in our selfishness when we are moving too fast and we don't care about people in the end that's the only thing that matters the only way people will come to you is if they know they matter and that's our job so forgive us god for all the times we have gone against you in this heal the people that we have wounded Help us to not create any more wreckage out there. And I pray for anyone that falls into the group that has a wicked or evil heart. Work a miracle on their behalf that they will be saved. And for those who are drifting that way and don't realize it, stop them. Whatever it takes, stop them, God, that they may be saved. So help us, Jesus, to lead by example, to be the bright, flaming light that you want us to be, the one that is different, the one that shows people they are the, they're the only one that matters to you. I ask this all in your precious name. Amen.